Greetings! It is I, Tantus Naravan Jacobin, Lord Emperor the Jacobin Empire, and welcome. It is time to continue my discussion on the history of Magic the Gathering, an expose where I talk about set to set, every set that was released historically, in order. Today we have the 30th expansion released by Magic, Mirrodin. This was the first set of the Mirrodin block and was released on October 2nd of 2003. It had 306 cards and was unique because this didn't have as many cards as the last big set in the last block. 44 cards were removed from this core, from this large expansion set to add 22 cards to each of this smaller two expansion set to sort of spread out the entire card total and balance them out a little bit more between these three. It had the themes of artifacts, of course, artifact lands, and equipment, and it introduced the keywords of affinity, particular for artifacts, imprint, and entwine. Its symbol was of the Sword of Kaldo, a card that actually was in the set. It was a smaller representation of that. It introduced a new keyword type, a subtype of artifacts, equipment, with the keyword equip on it. They functioned much like auras, except unlike auras, should the creature they were attached to leave the battlefield, go to the graveyard, then the equipment would stay out and play. Now, it is also known that a lot of the artifacts in the set alluded to previous artifacts that were printed in other sets, such as Chrome Mox. It featured Solum Simlicum, Jens Thorum's Invitational card, and it was the first expansion set to feature the new card face. Because of the high amount of artifacts within it, it actually was the set that they began to notice the problems between the coloration of the artifacts and white, and how it was very hard to tell the two of them apart. So this set in particular began to point that out. Now it sold in 15 card booster packs, a 75 card tournament pack, four pre-constructed decks, and a fat pack. Now the pre-release was on September 20th of 2003, and the pre-release card was a Sold of Cauldra. Now this was unique for two reasons. This was the first pre-release card that wasn't a creature. That's the first thing. And it was the first pre-release card to feature alternate art than the normal card in the set. So the Sword of Cauldra pre-release version had different art than the normal Sword of Cauldra. And of course it was accompanied by a novel called The Moons of Mirrodin. It did have two tokens that accompanied the set as, as magic players rewards, including a demon token. Now the story of the set is told within that novel, The Moons of Mirrodin. Effectively, it tells of this plane, Mirrodin. This plane that is an artificial one created by Karn, the planeswalker, and lorded over by Memnarch, basically what Karn put in charge of here. And it was Memnarch that named this plane Mirrodin after the Mirari. The inhabitants of Mirrodin are organic in and of themselves, but have metal components to their bodies. So they are both man and machine in a way. The realm is also orbited by four suns or moons. They're described as both depending on the inhabitants you talk to. They represent four of the colors of mana, black, blue, white, and red. Green is mysteriously absent from among them. The story is told focusing on Galissa Sunseeker, a powerful elf, uh, one of the greatest elves within Mirrodin, who seeks to find out why this mysterious force, known as the Levelers, seek to destroy her. And along the way, she begins to discover the mysteries of Mirrodin. Now, this set is infamous for its unbalancing of power within magic. There are a lot of abilities that are normally would be restricted to other colors, which you see split off. Basically, abilities that we normally restrict to a certain color are now in other colors, spread out. And also, there's a lot of abilities within the set that play off each other. For example, artifact lands playing off of affinity for artifacts. This led to a lot of bans and restrictions in amongst many of the cards from this set, including, of course, artifact lands. Of course, as I was saying, it has a heavy influence of artifacts throughout the set, including artifacts that have colored mana costs in order to pay them, which was a new thing introduced here. It also, of course, had the keywords of 
affinity. Affinity was a keyword that if you had a certain type of card within play, for each of those cards you had, the card with affinity cost you one colorless left. This was traditional artifacts, so effectively for each artifact you'd have, your affinity for artifact card would cost you one colorless mana less to play, though affinity itself could be for any type, really. There was imprint. Imprint was an artifact keyword that when an artifact with imprint would come into the battlefield, you would exile a card. Then the card with imprint would get an effect based upon the exiled card. Whatever casting cost, power, toughness, if it's a creature, the ability, if it's an instant, whatever it is, would have a direct effect on the imprint card, the card with imprint, and it would basically permanently have that ability from the card it exiled. Entwine was an ability that was on module spells. Module spells being the ones that had more than one choice of abilities you could choose between. Entwine allowed you to pay an extra mana cost and use both of the module abilities at the same time. Effectively, you could cast the one spell and rather than choosing one or the other, you could pay an extra cost and do both. And of course, as I said, there was equipment. Equipment with the keyword equip. Effectively, equipment was an artifact you could play upon the battlefield, and for a quip cost, you could attach it to a creature, similar to attaching an aura to a creature, then that creature would have the effects of the artifact. Should the creature die, then the creature would go to the graveyard, but the equipment would stay out in play, and you could once again play the equip cost to put it on another creature. It also was allowed that you could pay the same equip cost to move an equipment from a living creature to another living creature. You didn't have to wait for it to die to transfer effectively a sword or whatever it was from one creature to another. Now it's important to note amongst all the creature types that were in this set, it did have a focus on the five major tribes which had been in Onslaught, one from every color. So we had zombies, goblins, elves, etc. From those groups appeared here in good number. It is also important to note, this is the set where they introduced a new type of creature, human. Up until now, we didn't have human as a creature type. Now we do. Now the set had 11 cycles. It had a cycle of artifact lands. These were lands which, of course, counted as artifacts also. So they would affect things like affinity or anything else that required a number of artifacts. There you go. You have them already out in play. Each of them represented a different region within Mirrodin, basically in each territory, and they counted as both an artifact and a land, and you could tap them for a mana that attributed to that region. They had a cycle of entwined spells. These were common entwined spells that were effectively module spells that you could either have one or two of effects or pay the entwined cost to do both. And a cycle of golems. Each of them had effectively a color-specific ability linked directly to it. There was, of course, a cycle of mana mirrors. Each of these were mere creatures that could top for a mana of a certain color. There was an entire cycle of them. There was a cycle of rare colored artifacts, each of them linked to directly to one of the colors of mana that had abilities that pertained to it, and they were rare. It had a cycle of replicas. These were based upon each of the five tribes that were from Onslaught and actually shared a creature type with it. They were unique in that they had each had an ability of three mana, sacrificing them for an ability that's traditionally linked to the color of the tribe they are from. The shards were artifacts that would cost you three to put out, and for either three ma colorless mana or one mana of a certain color, you could tap it for an ability linked directly for the colored mana that you would use to activate it. So it would be a black type ability if you played the black mana, or you could do the three colorless to have a black type ability in a deck that maybe wasn't a black deck. There were the slits. They were 1-1 one, one uncommon that each had a cost of two of the same mana from whatever mana the slith was from, and each of them had the ability whenever it dealt combat damage to a player, you put a plus one, plus one counter on it. There were the spell bombs. These were common artifacts that had two abilities that required you to sacrifice them. One of them was the same for each of the spell bombs that it cost you one colorless, you'd sacrifice it to draw a card. There was a cycle of talismans. Each of these effectively recreated the abilities of a allied colored pain land that you could tap for one of two colors and take a damage. There were the towers, which cost you four mana to put out, but for eight and tapping it, a powerful effect based upon one of the, whatever color it seems to match with, that it's in fact affiliated with. 
It wasn't until Scars of Mirrodin that a red one, Tower of Calamities, was introduced. Before, it was only the other four colors. Now it had 17 reprinted cards, including a Tog, four functional reprints, including Dross Prowler, four Razortooth Rats, two color-shifted cards, including Rule of Law for Arcane Library, and two strictly better cards, including Teljad Chosen for Argothian Pixies from Antiquities. Now the four pre-constructed decks were a blue-black called Bait and Bludgeon, a white deck called Little Bashers, a black-red called Sacrificial Burn, and a green deck called Wicked Big. Now let's talk about some of the cards from this. There was Altar of Shadows. At the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, add one black mana to it, to your mana pool for each charge counter on it, and for seven in tapping it, you can destroy target creature and put a charge counter on Altar of Shadows. A little bit of creature destruction that also adds mana. There's Author's Light, Roof Target, Artifact, or Enchantment for the game. Sort of better in a way than something like Disenchant, because it removes it from the game. A little more expensive. Blink Moth Urn. At the beginning of each player's pre-combat main phase, if Blink Moth Urn is untapped, that player adds one colors mana to their mana pool for each artifact they control. So it's a great way if you're playing an artifact deck to get a lot of mana. And maybe you want to tap it to get less people other mana get other people less mana if uh you don't want them to have it also. Bosh Iron Golem, a 6-7 Trample Golem that for three colorless and a red, you could sacrifice an art artifact and Bosh Iron Golem would deal damage equal to the artifact's converted mana cost to target creature or player. So sacrifice artifacts to blow stuff up. Chalice of the Void, an XX artifact that whenever that comes into play with X charge counters on it. Whenever a player plays a spell with a converted mana cost of X, counter that spell. So effectively, you basically shut out a X cost of converted mana cost of spells. Chimney Imp, 1-2 Flyer. When Chimney Imp is put in a graveyard from play, target opponent puts, the, puts a card from their hand on the top of their library. Couple combos with that. Chrome Mox, it has Imprint. You exile a non-land, non- non-artifact card when you put Chrome Mox into play. Then you could tap and add to your mana pool any mana that that exiled card had in its casting cost. Basically, whatever car color that card you exiled is, Chrome Mox produces those colors, since you imprinted it. Dampening Matrix. Active abilities of artifacts and creatures do not activate unless it is a mana ability. Discipline of the Vault. Whenever an artifact is put into the graveyard from play, from anyone, you may have target opponent lose one life. Extra plane lens. You imprint, you exile land you control from the game. But whenever a land of the same name as the exiled one is tapped for mana, its controller may add one extra mana of a mana it could produce to their mana pool. Fabricate. Search your library for an artifact card, reveal it, and put it in your hand. It is a cornerstone of many artifact decks. Fate Spinner. At the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, they choose draw, main, or combat. Each instance of any phase or step of their turn uh, that would occur of this type doesn't happen. So effectively, you have your opponents choose if they get to draw this turn, if they get to have a main phase, or if they get a combat phase. Choose one of them not to have. Galvanic Key. It has flash, and for three tap, you can untap an artifact. Guild of Lois. Tap. Add three mana of any color to your mana pool. Galissa Sunseeker, a 3-2 first strike that has tap. Destroy target artifact if its converted mana cost is equal to the amount of mana in your mana pool. Isochron Scepter, it has imprint. When it enters the battlefield, you exile a instant from your hand with a converted mana cost of two or less. Then for two and tapping it, you can have Isochron Scepter basically create a copy of said spell that you exiled with it originally, that you imprinted onto it. You don't pay that copy's mana cost. You just pay the ability to copy it with Isochrom Scepter. Crack's Thumb. If you'd flip a coin, flip two coins, and choose the one you want to use. If you're playing a lot of red coin flipping decks, you want this. Leon in Abundance. Artifacts you control have hexproof. Lightning Greaves. A quick, creeper, a quick creature has haste and shroud. It costs you zero to equip it. Luxodon Warhammer. Equipped creature gets plus three plus O, trample and lifelink, and for three, you can equip it. It's pretty much a lot like Armadillo Cloak, which I talked about previously, 
on equipment. Luminous Angel, a 4-4 flyer at the beginning of your upkeep, you create a 1-1 flying spirit token. That's white. Pretty good for getting some tokens out there. March of the Machines. Non-creature artifacts that you control are artifact creatures with power and toughness equal to their converted mana cost. You make all your artifacts creatures. Mind's Eye. Whenever an opponent would draw a card, you may pay one to draw a card. So I like Mind's Eye a lot to basically get you extra drawing. Just basically you rely on other people to draw cards and then you pay mana to copy them. Mind Slaver. For four, tap it. Sacrifice it. You control target players next turn. You basically steal someone's turn. You do what you want with your new deck and hand and everything like that. You could attack yourself, but in such a strategic way to decimate your opponent. You control them in every aspect on their next turn. Pentavis. It's a 0-0 zero, zero that comes into play with 5 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. And for 1 colors, you could remove a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Pentavis to put a 1-1 one, one flying Pentavite token into play. Or for another 1 colorless, you could sacrifice a Pentavite token to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter back on Pentavite. So basically, you could split it up into a lot of little creatures or have it one big creature. Your choice. Platinum Angel. A 4-4 flyer. You can't lose the game. And your opponents can't win the game. So effectively, the only option as long as Platinum Angel out, is out in play is you winning. Quicksilver Elemental. A3-4. For a blue mana, you copy all of target creatures' activated abilities. Blue mana may be used as mana of any color when activating these abilities. So you can use Quicksilver Elemental to copy every other creatures and plays activate abilities that you want. And you can use blue mana for any of them, no matter what color it was originally. These activate abilities do only last until end of turn. You'll have to pay for it the next turn if you want to activate it again. Reviver Demon, 6-6 six, six Flyer. If you put it into play from your hand, destroy all non-black, non-artifact creatures. They can't be regenerated. Second Sunrise. Each player returns all artifacts, enchantments, creatures, and lands that were put into the graveyard from play this turn back to play. It's the ultimate anti-board wipe card. Solemn Simlicum. When it enters the battlefield, you can search your library for a basic land and put it into play tapped. When Solemn Simmercom is put into the graveyard from play, you may draw a card. So it's the kind of artifact that you want to play and then sacrifice to another artifact or something else in order to get more stuff. Possibly bring it back to repeat it over and over again. Soul Foundry. It has imprint. Remove a creature card from your hand from the game. But for X and tap, you can put a token that is a copy of the exiled creature that the creature you exiled when imprinting into, the, into play where X is its converted mana cost. So if I exile a four cost creature, I can pay four each turn, tap Soul Foundry, and start creating token copies of the creature I exiled. Soul of Cauldra, a quick creature gets plus five, plus five. If a quick creature would deal damage to a creature, remove that creature from the game. Equip cost four. Tooth and Nail, it's a module, a modal spell. You either, you choose one of these two. You can either search your library of a card for two creature cards, reveal them, and put them into your hand, or take two creature cards from your hand and put them into play. Or you can entwine it and do both. I like Tooth and Nail. Tower of Fortune, my favorite of the towers. Eight tap, draw four cards. Videlkin Archmage. Whenever you cast an artifact spell, you may draw a card. So if you're playing an artifact deck, you can probably draw a lot of cards and cycle through them, putting out a lot of artifacts, getting more cards. Viridian Longbow, a quick creature has tap, Deal one damage to target creature or player. For three, you can equip it. It's the artifact equipment that turns your creature into effectively prodigal sorcerer, into the Timmy. So that's it for today. I talked about Mirrodin. Mirrodin is interesting because it is, it is the first set in a while to focus on artifacts since the Urza's block. But even the Urza's block didn't focus on it quite the same way that Antiquities did. So truly this is the first set in a block that was true focus artifacts, much more than so. As I said, the Urza's block did have a huge influence of artifacts, but this was even more. And it introduced interesting abilities that played off a cover. Affinity for artifacts, artifact lands, artifacts that use color mana, equipment. At the time, equipment was seen in interesting light. Some people embraced it. Some people despised it as it was 
like an aura, but better? But there were always extra costs associated with it that made it more difficult to use, and made it not always as cost-effective as the aura in the long run. Hence why there's an advantage to using either, which still exists to today. And that's why it balances out these two abilities in the long run. It also included interesting abilities, entwine. I want to play that module spell. I can do both. Imprint, where I can basically gain the abilities of something repeatedly by imprinting it on an artifact, sort of imprinting and copying a spell, copying a creature, maybe getting extra mana production. All of these are very interesting abilities that they introduced and enhanced it, making it unbalanced, but also very fun and powerful but also, in a way, a refresher to a lot of things. It was the first set in the new format, and showed very much so that artifacts and white spells looked exactly alike and were hard to tell apart. It helped bring back magic, in a way, from the apocalypse. It continued a storyline from the Odyssey block, from the Odyssey and Onslaught blocks. It continued that storyline in a way because we saw what happened to Kamal's sister? She went to Argentum, which would become Mirrodin. So you can see it's all very connected at this point in time, at least in the storylines. And it allowed us to move into new planes. The first of a new plane since the Weatherlight, the Weatherlight block, which explored new planes, but they were on a journey from Dominaria, and they really went to Wrath, an artificial plane. That was the real place they went, and everywhere else was just a journey along the way. This was the first time we're focusing on it in the entire story, on a new plane, since Homelands. And Homelands did it bad. This did it right. But if you have any questions, comments, anything you want to say, anything you think I left out, please leave in the comments below. Please like, share, and subscribe. It's your support of the channel, The Empire, The Work I Do. If you want to show some extra support, you can always check out my Patreon, link in the description below. If you want to check out some more great Magic Gathering content, I can recommend my friends of the multiverse, Card Bazaar, They Said, We Said, and Tasty Snackies. They do great Magic Gathering content. I cannot recommend them more to check them out. Do some really awesome stuff with people. But regardless, until the next time, I bid you farewell.